First of all, I think a lot of conspiracies do go on. I agree with uh, historian Carl Oglesby, a multitude of conspiracies contend in the night. I think it's normal mammalian behavior. On the other hand, conspiracy buffs tend to be somewhere between mildly paranoid and full-flown clinical paranoid, and I don't trust many of them very much. I think the only conspiracy theorists I really take seriously are Buckminster Fuller, Noam Chomsky, and Carl Oglesby, and all the rest of them seem in varying degrees of paranoia. But you don't feel that it's the whole field is just simply paranoid fantasy? Absolutely not. The idea that conspiracies don't occur is like saying snow never happens. It's, it's, it's contradicted by all the facts of history. You pick up any book of history and you find they're talking about conspiracies in ancient Rome, conspiracies in Renaissance Italy, conspiracies within the British government in the Elizabethan age. History is largely a history of conspiracies. To claim conspiracies don't exist is, uh, it's an article of faith, like the Darwinian idea that there's no intelligence anywhere and everything happened by accident or the uh, Christian idea that a guy named Yahweh built the whole universe while living on a cloud a few miles above Israel and sending fire and brimstone down on everybody who infuriated him or seriously vexed him, I should say. You uh, distinguish between fungible and non-fungible in relationship to conspiracy theory. Can you explain those terms? Fungible is a legal term. Uh, it's related to the RICO law. Uh, well, it originally started in, uh, in mercantile law. A uh, product is fungible if every part of it is the same. Like if you're selling corn and it's 90% corn and 10% junk you found in the backyard, it's non-fungible. Gold brick, it looks like it's solid gold, but it's mostly lead. That was a very popular swindle in the 19th century. The theory of fungibility, as I apply it to conspiracy theories, is when people go really bonkers and they say every member of the group is equally evil and they're all involved in the conspiracy and you can't trust any of them, etc. That's the kind of thing that Adolf Hitler taught. And I think those theories are always crazy, whether they pick on the Jews or the Jesuits or the Freemasons or whoever they pick out. I don't believe in fungible conspiracies. There are degrees of involvement. Is he winning? That's a question they use a lot in the CIA. That means how much does he know about what he's doing? Another useful term to remember is useful idiot. I think that started in British intelligence. A useful idiot is somebody who's working for an intelligence agency but doesn't know it. The theories I find are really dangerous, are like anti-Semitism, which led to unprecedented horrors in this century. and horrors on lesser scales because they had lesser technology throughout the history of Christendom. And I find a lot of feminism to be equally nefarious and implication, although they haven't had enough power to do anything about it. But some of the feminists, when they talk about men, they sound just like Adolf Hitler talking about Jews. It's really scary. The parallel is so damn close. And then there are these theories where all the Freemasons in the world are part of one gigantic conspiracy for the Freemasons to take over everything and run everything. I know too many Freemasons to take that seriously. Freemasons are as miscellaneous a group as the Presbyterians, uh, the plumbers. You find all sorts of people in the Freemasons, and they don't all have the same ideas. So the way you use the term, it means a kind of absolute blanket generalization about any group. It's treating a group as homogenous. Homogenous would be a good synonym for fungible. So you feel we can uh, throw those conspiracies out just based on their fungibility? On the face of it, everybody has different fingerprints. There are no two brains that are alike. So the idea that you can make generalizations about a large and miscellaneous group and they'll be true about every member of that group, that I think is the most nefarious form of stupidity on the planet. Well, what's so interesting with that particular form of uh, conspiracy theory is that it contains what you call a strange loop. Oh, yeah. When you say Bertrand Russell looked into the evidence and concluded that the bankers of Europe consisted 90% of Gentiles and only 10% of Jews, 
So the Jewish banker's conspiracy is a myth, and they'll come back with Bertrand Russell was Jewish himself. He changed his name. <laughs> then you got to try to prove that Bertrand Russell wasn't Jewish. You know? <laughs> I actually got into that argument once with somebody about you, Hefner. They were convinced he was Jewish. All pornography is created by Jews. Hefner is a pornographer, therefore Hefner is Jewish. I thought, let me say Presbyterian. No, he changed his name. <laughs> Sartre is the only one who's ever commented on this, the delight in being stupid. If you make up your mind you're going to defend a really stupid position, you can get every intelligent person in the room hopping mad. No matter how rational they think they are, they'll eventually get as They'll get more emotional than you are if you just keep repeating the same stupid thing. This is in a, an essay he wrote called The Anti-Semite and the Jew. And if you're not Jewish and you try to argue with an anti-Semite about his prejudices, the next thing you know, you are yelling and shouting and acting like a fanatic more than he is because he's saying so many stupid things like, you must be Jewish yourself. Now, how about you? Well, then your wife is Jewish and she's corrupted you. <laughs> no, my wife isn't Jewish either. Well, then it was your grandfather. <laughs> and, you know, and when you get into this infinite regress uh, like that, eventually you lose your temper and then you feel you're, you're as dumb as the guy you're arguing with. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes called that the hydrostatic principle of controversy. <laughs> the fools drag everybody down to their own level. Well, Sartre noticed this particularly in anti-Semites. Uh, but I've noticed it in all sorts of dogmatic people uh, that hold this terrain, like the flat earthers. You, you get into an argument with a flat earther, and I guarantee you lose your temper before he loses his, because he's enjoying being stupid. He's enjoying making you angry <laughs> just by sticking to a position which he knows nobody else can believe. That also gives you a feeling of being belonging to the elite. Everybody else is too stupid to see the truth, but I belong to the small group that knows the truth. After you believe that, you're ready when the leader says, here's, here's your cyanide Kool-Aid, have a drink. You go, oh, yeah, sure, <laughs> and you swallow it all down. Do you believe that most conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorists are working from a basis of a rational and logical will to determine the facts of a situation? You know, is it scientific or is this completely some kind of emotional? Well, it covers the gamut. It's, uh, I, I, I like to think of things on a scale of one to ten. And I would say some conspiracy theories on a scale from 1 to 10, where 1 is sanity and 10 is total raving lunacy, certifiably insane, as they say. I, I would say most conspiracy theorists are somewhere above 5 on that scale, and a lot of them have reached 10. But there are some that are pretty close to 1, like Carl Oglesby and a couple of other offbeat historians, Noam Chomsky, Buckminster Fuller, and me. Like I said, everything is under control. Conspiracy theories help make sense out of what otherwise seems a senseless world. That's why so many people believe them, including me sometimes. <laughs> How much do you think our own uh, government operates on the basis of conspiracy theory? Well, I think they worry about conspiracies more than the most conspiracy buffs do. I think the government is full of people with guilty consciences, and they're constantly worried we're going to find out what they're really up to. And so they hire more and more spies to spy on us to find out what we're doing and saying to see if we're getting to be a real menace to them. And of course, uh, that means they need more spies to spy on their spies in case some of their spies are double agents, which is well known in this, in the whole espionage business. So then they need a third order of spies to spy on the second order of spies. And eventually you end up with somebody like J. Edgar Hoover who uses his power to blackmail the presidents of the United States. Stalin murdered three chiefs of the secret police in a row because they found out too much about his own secrets. And nobody murdered J. Edgar Hoover, at least I don't think so. I think he died of natural causes. But he was blackmailing presidents from Roosevelt on. He blackmailed every president who wanted to do something Hoover did in the first. Like Nixon said in one of the Watergate tapes, well, Hoover performed. He would have scared hell out of them. He's got a file on everybody. He just sensed the, uh, the, the envy in Nixon's. He wanted to file on everybody, too. He was a rank amateur. Hoover had been at it for 50 years by then. And a lot of the files disappeared the day he died, by the way. Nobody will admit they know what happened to them. Somebody has those files and is still blackmailing people. The government is more afraid of us than we are of them. That's what I, 
always emphasize when I'm talking to radical groups who think their phones are tapped. Well, of course your phone is tapped. If you've done anything to annoy the government, your phone is tapped. They've probably got a mail cover on you, too. But that just shows they're more afraid of you than you are of them. The, the government doesn't trust the people. And then they wonder why the people don't trust the government. Well, the people don't trust the government because they know we're being spied on all the time. At the last count I heard, there were, uh, there were over 200,000 lawyers working for the federal government. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know how much harm a single lawyer can do? A single lawyer can ruin your whole life, you know, <laughs> just one day in court. 200,000 lawyers devising modifications and amendments to laws and working for Congress and changing, you know. The, the, the bureaucracy, the Kafkaesque world they have created is so onerous, obnoxious, and unbearable to most of the citizenry that everybody bitches about the government at least part of the time. Ergo, the government knows they are not well loved, and they're wondering how many of us are joining militias or forming revolutionary communist parties like those nuts down in the South or doing something else to race us all So they've got to keep spying on us to make sure we're not getting too honorary. And the more the people discover the government is spying on them, the more they distrust the government.